it's such a long run bet. Um, the first reactors will be expensive and difficult to produce. But what you're doing is you're getting an unlimited fuel supply forever. You get the fuel out of seawater, you dig it out of the ground. It's like a lot of the fuel types are very abundant materials and they have a similar energy density as stuff like uranium and plutonium, which are toxic and hazardous and harder to extract. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's like the last energy source humanity will ever need. How's it, what's it like trying to keep up with like breaking news all over the world that's like happening in real time in your, in your specific industry? Yeah, you know, that's funny. Uh, I think this is the first time archive has been like a competitive sport or something, or like people are like actively racing to refresh like the material <laughs> science section or condensed matter physics section of archive. It's kind of like, what, what is going on? Um, but yeah, it's been interesting. I think it's a great, you know, it's great that people take an interest in, in these kind of basic science things. They're, they're pretty much usually out of the spotlight. Yeah. It feels like this like slow motion Michael Bay movie of sort of like people all over the world, like coming together, finding each other on Twitter. I, I can't imagine how many sort of new connections have been made of people that didn't were, were just lurkers before that are suddenly like, oh my God, this is my, this is my spot. This is my time. I gotta, I gotta speak out. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I think it is an interesting um, social phenomenon, right? For, for people to rally behind something that's like a fundamentally optimistic narrative that's like very, you know, hopeful about something. Um, usually the kind of viral news stories are just really bad, it's just really bad news. It's like some disaster or something. So yeah, that was kind of interesting. Yeah. I, 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 was it you that said this is like, we're seeing the same information patterns, but that happened with COVID, a negative phenomenon that is now happening with like a positive phenomenon? I, I don't know if I said that, um, but that's interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting comparison. It's kind of true. I mean, both of them are, you know, here's this, here's this potentially very big deal that's unfolding in real time. And so you're very incentivized to be aware of it. Um, but this one was really all about, you know, this kind of more basic material science thing rather than like hospital rates. And I mean, they're, they're very different phenomena and very different scales too. I think this was really just confined mostly to just some people on Twitter, I think pretty much. I mean, it's kind of funny, like it's just people tweeting on this stuff and you know, whatever. We're just like, hey, like this is what I read. This is cool. I didn't expect to find that. And then, um, and then all these newspapers are like running with headlines and trying to keep up, you know, like the reporters are trying to keep up because it's all, it's happening real time somewhere else. Yeah. I, I want to sort of set the, uh, context for, for this conversation and the rest of it by reading one of your tweets, um, which is every company builds products using the same limited set of available foundational technologies. Every few decades, physics produces something fundamentally new that changes what's physically possible. If successful, LK99 would be a watershed moment for humanity, easily on par with the invention of the transistor, overnight revolutionizing all of electronics and technology. So this uh, LK99 is the superconductor that has sort of been like setting this little corner of Twitter on fire. And I, of all the people that I've followed and all the threads that I've read, um, you seem to strike this kind of amazing balance of like, a balanced perspective on the optimism and, and sort of scientific cynicism approachable, but really not afraid to sort of like carry forward the implications into why this is important and put it all into a really big context, which is why I really wanted to like have this conversation kind of a longer form and just try to pull on a bunch more of those threads because it's so hard to jump around on Twitter. It's just a lot more work to like assemble it. And I feel like if we can do it all in like one big body of work here, um, it'll really help people kind of wrap their heads around, around superconductors in general, as it's sort of an example of the technological progress that we're seeing. That's like right on the edge of like raw science turning into like, holy shit, there's a new technology turning into, oh, here's the societal change that comes out of that. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's a theme in a lot of my writing that I kind of pursue, which is this, um, we never really know how great things might be in the near future because we really can't see the revolutions coming, right? Yet we keep experiencing them. Okay. And so we have this weird short-term memory where it's like things have constantly been changing again and again and again. Yet at the same time, we look at our problems right now and think, oh my God, we're never going to solve these. It's impossible. Right? So I think reminding people of, of the, 
dramatic changes that can come about through sort of advances in fundamental science um, is really important. You know, Isaac Asimov had this quote, which I thought was great, which is, science can wonder and amaze, but it's engineering that changes the world, right? So really understanding the connection between science as it is pushing the frontiers of knowledge and capability, engineering as it relates to the practical application of these things in our material social world, and then, and then one more step, which is, how is the world different? How is life different? What's it like to be a person in a world with, you know, nuclear rockets or like, you know, new spacecraft engines or faster computers or, you know, brain implants or superconductors. So it's kind of funny. I mean, the supernatural thing, something I've worked on for a while and it's always been very interesting. Um, I first wrote about it like a month before all this happened, right? I just had this thread. I was just like, hey, look, you know, we've had progress so far. We keep breaking expectations. Nobody thought we could ca- have high temperature superconductors in 1986 came out of nowhere, broke our theories, and there was a Nobel Prize, and it's enabled all this new stuff. So I thought, yeah, what if that just happens again? Like, what, you know, what would happen, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then a month later, this story breaks out, and I was like, oh, hey, that's uh, cool. <laughs> yeah. So so uh, let's do the superconductors as sort of the first one of these, like, science turn engineering turn societal impact. Because, um, yeah, you were writing about superconductors before they were cool. Um, but l- let's talk about sort of the, the paper <laughs> that the paper that started this whole phenomenon. Uh, so talk about the paper that started the whole phenomenon. Yeah, sure. So, well, so that paper came out, I think it was actually, it kind of lingered for a while. Nobody saw it. Um, and my buddy, Ryan, uh, McKenta, she put it online on Twitter and it got up some attention and just kind of said, oh, we're so back like this paper. Right. And then another guy picked it up and then it became more popular. So, you know, um, that paper uh, was really interesting. You know, if you look at like the field of publications in that topic area, it maybe isn't something that would normally stand out. So it was sort of selected for by this crowd behavior in some way. Um, You know, it had some, the first time I wrote about this, I just kind of called it the good, the bad, the ugly, right? And and, and the good is kind of simple, like, okay, there's some reasonability here, some viability in a sense, like there's this an analysis of the crystal structure, it's using compounds, like, so it's using copper and oxygen, which are, you know, previously found in superconductors and stuff. So it wasn't like out of the blue saying it's like an impossible material. Um, and it was also easy to reproduce, right? So it would have been easy to check because they gave you synthesis methods. They made some specific predictions about the crystal structure. Um, you know, the bad part was it was missing a few key measurements, right? Um, both in things you normally look for in a superconductor, like a very sharp transition temperature, right? They had kind of like a more decaying transition temperature, which means at what temperature does it have finite resistance and then drop all of a sudden to zero resistance? There's also some other, you know, things that were kind of quirky, like the scaling on their plots, it sort of hid important details. Um, and yeah, so there's a bit of like things missing there, but it wasn't, it was like 80% there, you know, it was sort of 70%, it, you know, like if they had filled in the details and it looked like it was rushed, story came out, it was rushed. There was some politics going on with the authors. Um, and so it kind of had this, uh, you know, it had like this plausibility kind of thing to it, where it's like, oh, you know, so, so I think that was part of it. Um, but, you know, I think the thing that really struck a chord with people's imagination was there's nothing physically impossible about this, um, but the impacts were so huge. And so even, you know, Paul Graham said it well, he said, this is a great lesson in expectation time, right? Because, uh, you know, even a conservative MIT prof said like, ah, this is, you know, 5% chance this is real. It's like, oh, you know, 5% chance of this is a big thing. <laughs> you know, what's a, what's a 1% chance of an asteroid, right? That's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think it had, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So is it, yeah, the paper itself, I think, triggered a lot of interest and speculation a lot of re- replication attempts. And um, it was an interesting sort of, uh, you know, phenomenon in people's imaginations, I think. Yeah, and I think there's a few interesting things in there. One, th- the ease of replication sort of kicked off this whole, like, I- I'm a big believer in like, you know, popular science, everybody should be able to replicate anything. Replications aren't hostile, they're, you know, a support of science and verifications. And this was something that people could do, not quite in their garage probably unless they had some badass equipment in their garage but certainly in a lot of workplaces a lot of universities were able to do it and so we got a ton of replication attempts and a ton of sort of iterations on the method and the materials and things like that um 
And it's something that's interesting in there that you pointed out, I think, is every time we discover we have a new discovery in superconductors, that it's usually representative of a whole class. It, it like kicks off a series of similar improvements. Um, I'm playing Battleship. You know, we like discovered a new zone to like iterate within. Yeah, that's very true. I can respond to that. Yeah. So if you look at this plot of different material compositions, you can kind of see it's like these kind of little branches in a plot versus time climbing to higher and higher temperatures, right? Which is kind of cool. Uh, so yeah, people find new compositions that can be quite different from each other. Um, and then, you know, they kind of improve them a bit, they optimize them, they tweak them. And it's a really interesting process. Um, you know, the space of possible materials, if you think about the atomic composition and the crystal structure, it's so giant. It's so, so big, right? Just for example, just so suppose I have I was looking at the numbers in this recently. Suppose I have a, a little crystal unit cell that could have like 10, 10 atoms or something, or 20 atoms, you know, it's like 10 to the 11 combinations, okay? And then it's like 20 atoms, it's like 10 to the 28 combinations and 30 atoms, 10 to the 37 atoms. It's just like, it just blows up so fast, like the number of combinations. Um, and all of, all of those combinations have very unique kind of what you call electronic structure. And we say electronic usually means circuits, but in the material science sense, it usually means like, what are the allowable energies for electrons? What are the orbitals, what you call, you know, so the shape of those orbitals and where do they overlap with each other? And that determines a lot of these interesting properties that scientists then simulated for this LK99 study. Um, and yeah, so, so finding a good starting point, it's like finding gold in a river, right? You know, the mountain range is so big. Okay, everyone's out there looking for gold and you can't search the whole mountain range. It's, it's just take a billion years. So if you find gold flakes in a river, there's a good chance there's a bigger gold deposit nearby, right? So you can start off with a material that's not that promising and optimize it and tweak it and get better within that range of mountains and then find where the real gold is. It, it seems uh, like that idea sort of rhymes with the phase shifts in computing. You know, we had like started very mechanical and then moved to, you know, transistors and chip, like the, as that has changed over time and we're like maybe due for another one um going to biological compute or optical or quantum and I, I know this feeds into quantum computing so maybe we'll come back to that a little later um something else you said i didn't realize that this paper had lingered for a while before somebody picked it up well i think it came out like july 22nd um which was a few days before. I mean, it just wasn't right away, I guess. Um, you, that made me that made me worry about the like, what else might be out there that people aren't snapping up and you know publishing and trying to replicate and yeah. see like how efficient is the market of archive and new scientific papers being sort of read and spread. The science market is uh, an interesting one. Just for reference, something like eighty percent of publications cannot ever get replicated or. The people that try can't replicate them kind of thing. So it's a very low replication rate in general. Scientific findings are very unique and one-off. And there's no doubt a lot of, um, you can think of, you know, publications that are, well, there's a few effects here, right? So, so think of the publication as like this tree that's branching out in all these different directions, people trying different things, right? So sometimes people will get negative results on a topic and, and one or two things could happen. One is they don't publish that. So no one else knows and they think they'll try it too. So you kind of waste time trying things that haven't worked before. Another one is they think it doesn't work, but maybe it would have actually worked if they had done it a bit differently. And then you kind of trim that branch and people don't pursue it. Um, so there's definitely a wealth of knowledge embedded in our like legacy of publications over time that are both open to reinterpretation and open to re-experimentation, I think. Um, but you know, as scientific careers unfold, people are trying to claim new territory to build their publication record history, right? So there's not as much incentive always to pick up those old things to kind of, you know, um, find diamonds in the rough, I guess you could say. And, and on your uh, brute force point, I think someone did the math on this and was like, it would have taken like half the compute power in the United States, 10,000 years to brute force find this configuration. But once we had the configuration from experimentation, they could, the simulation, as you pointed out, could like do experimental iterations um, 
nearby and discover a lot of cool stuff or at least validate the possibility of it. 100%. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting little subtopic. By the way, when all, when all this was blowing up, I had a I had a very quick idea for a startup how I would approach this in a venture back business. How would you commercialize room temperatures? We can talk about that later if you want, but so this cool thing in this field of simulations. So what these simulations are, you take a bunch of atoms, right? And they all have kind of like um, energy levels around them, kind of electron orbital shapes, you could say. And uh, what's really happening is that those atoms are like defining the potential energy function for an area. And then you do what's called solving the Schrodinger equation, which is like given a certain different equation, seeing where you can find solutions to it. And that, those are basically where electrons are allowed to live. So that's like a many body problem. If you're familiar with physics, like this many body problem, meaning it's like impossible to get analytic solutions to. So the standard you know, software is called this Vienna ab initio simulations package. Basically what it does is it uses a bunch of approximations to solve the Schrodinger equation in these different situations. And, and it has varying degrees of approximation accuracy and people develop modules or abilities to include other kinds of effects into it as well. So the simulations aren't deterministic of a material's properties. They're trying to approximate it in some way. Um, but what people have found, and I was reading some articles on this, is when you have a starting location, you can use what's called like an evolutionary algorithm, which is sort of like defining some fitness function saying, I want this, you know, I want uh, a square watermelon. Okay, that's my fitness function. And now I'm going to start breeding watermelons over time, picking the ones that are the most square. And eventually I can maybe hopefully breed a square watermelon. Um, and it's the same thing with the simulation package where I can start with a configuration and then evolve from there towards a desired direction. And that's, that's actually been shown to be a fairly effective like means of exploring or traversing the state space. Um, that has issues as well. Like you, you can think, well, how do I get over local minima? Does a solution have to smoothly converge in terms of like its quality? Cause then you can never kind of get over a hill into a better region. Right. So there's other things there. Um, but yeah. Yeah. It, it, it does seem there's a lot of, um, you know, simulations are necessarily like imperfect because we don't actually understand all of the specific, the quantitative, like full formulation of what we're replicating or what we're trying to simulate. Um, nature, nature is intractably complicated and, um, you know, it sort of has unlimited floating point accuracy, right? Uh, <laughs> There's this common phrase sort of in physics sometimes you hear, it's like, the only perfect simulation is the object itself, right? Because that has the full fidelity. Yeah, the map know, is not things the territory. Interact. Yeah. yeah, that's another way of saying it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, so let's, let's, uh, let's unfold the, your idea for commercializing room temperature superconductors. Okay, yeah, totally, totally. Okay, so that's great. So, so yeah, so back to the mountain analogy. So we're mining for gold, right? And some guy finds some flakes in the river and, you know, like the prospecting 101, right? It's all about where's your claim? Where's your plot, right? So the first thing to ask yourself is this guy found river in the Sierra Hills or whatever. Uh, is he probably standing on the best ore right away, right? Is it, you know, does he have the IP already? And the answer is, well, probably not actually. Like, so, you know, there's probably other ways of getting there, right? Another thing to think about is, you know, the first, the last time high temperature supernovas were discovered, 1986, took like 30 years for them to get engineered into a package that's commercially viable too. So there's lots of competitive landscape to conquer in the engineering optimization of this stuff. So, so the strategy has got to be basically this, look, how do we strip mine the hills? Okay. Find like, not just use picks and shovels. People always talk about picks and shovels, gold rush. I want that machine from Germany that just like scoops up the ground. Okay. in giant buckets at once. So what does that machine look like in material science? And this is just, I mean, this is all super off the cuff. So people will probably say that's whatever, but you, so you get a really awesome high compute team, people that are used to running simulations. Right. Um, and then you just start, you know, high throughput, simulating these Schrodinger equations, solving them, evolutionary search algorithms, all this kind of stuff. There's ML feedback loops you can do within that, that accelerate it, like evolutionary algo is one of them. Um, and then on the other side, you got to have like a, a material component, which is this field of what's called like basically robotic self-driving laboratories. And this is a field that's just recently emerged. There's a conference in Toronto later this month in a couple of weeks. Although it's, you know, really it's $500 million was just granted by Canadian government to University of Toronto to investigate constructing these things in a really like, you know, productized fashion, I guess, or, or a very high throughput, more capable fashion. My buddy, he just did his PhD 
um, on the topic of self-driving robotic laboratories. And uh, yeah, the gist is, so it's like a super multi-axis arm with a bunch of different interchangeable tool heads. And then around it, it has like, it could have a rail, it's moving around, but it has basically just a bunch of laboratory stations and it can like mix materials, grind compounds, sample them, whatever, put them in an oven, take them out, time everything. It, you know, you're using computer vision, you're using uh, like, like inverse kinematics to control the motors, all this kind of stuff. Um, as well as then the materials testing, right? So you can imagine, think of, think of like a warehouse filled with like, you know, those like sushi restaurants where this like sushi chef is cooking at the grill right in front of you, everyone's sitting around, something like that size, right? Except it's just a robot arm. And instead of a sushi grill, it's like a bunch of laboratory stations. And the robot arm is just like, it's like sure the Tesla factory, right? It's just like trying stuff constantly, grinding through. So you have a warehouse full of that, maybe 20, 50 of those. They cost like a few million bucks each, I guess. Um, and they're just speed running the material science. They're just speed running 30 years of academic research as fast as possible. And so those robots are also amenable to a kind of ML optimization called Bayesian learning, which is actually kind of more simple. It's when you have a very black box model, because <clears throat> you don't, you know, the robots aren't positing causal mechanisms behind why the materials act a certain way. They're just exploring the configuration space of preparation methods. But then you have the simulations team that actually has the theory of why materials behave the way they do, right? So you have these two areas of operations that can also be in feedback with each other, right? So that's the sort of like heavy compute, heavy robotic enabled, why now? It's because these tools are just available, this kind of stuff. We're going to raise, you know, $300 billion or 300 million to start, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and it's one of those things where, look, this company, you, you could have raised over the course of that company's life, you probably could have put two, three billion dollars in it and have a thousand X return because because the market size of these application spaces is in the trillions of dollars. And that's an annual annual market size, right? So it's, it's totally nuts. It's totally nuts. It, in the output of that, you conceive to be like a new material science breakthrough where you own the IP of the material or you're actually like, I mean, imagine drug discovery could be really accelerated this way too. like that. That feedback loop is generalizable, but material science just because the market is so big. Uh, the market is so big. Yep. That's right. Very good analogy in material is right in, um, life science. So a lot of, a lot of startups in the space have raised a lot of money for what's called in silico simulations, which are trying to find like ideal, um, you know, adapters or antibodies, therapeutics, that kind of stuff, uh, in simulation before they start to try to do trials and testing on cell models or animal models, that kind of stuff, right? Save a lot of time. Basically, the funnel for pharma development is so wide at the beginning and narrows down to such a thin point, the more you can do to kind of eat up the top of the funnel and, and, and you know, get better viable candidates, instead of one out of a thousand working, you have one out of 20 working, right? That saves a lot of money up front. Um, you know, R&D drug cost is like a billion dollars or something to, to bring to market or 10 years, I think that was, that's about right. Yeah, it's crazy, right? But a lot of analogies too. So there's also like lab companies like Transcriptic uh, was a company that tried to provide laboratories a service, which was like, we can, we can send you our protocols. It's all life science stuff. Send you our protocol. They have like, you know, robots that can just kind of do the operations, give you back the results. I think those have found mixed results. Par partially, I think life science is, is, can be very difficult because there's a much higher degree of chaos, complexity with like, you know, the temperature, I mean, material science is similar though, really, both, both of them are very high. They're very, they're very skilled. They're very skilled, difficult disciplines, right? Cross-contamination is brutal, all this kind of stuff. So uh, I think, uh, both the startup idea and the, uh, paper background are good lead-ins to the kind of discussion around like the, the engineering and impact of, of superconducting materials. Um, so, you know, this, maybe as an example of why this market is so big, let's talk about like the value of superconductors and the impact of them. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. So, uh, one of the tweets I put out there, um, I was trying to like expose all this thinking to people, right. To kind of get them thinking about it too. Right. So you can really think, and I'll just reason by analogy. So, you know, 1986, we had what's called the yttrium barium high temperature superconductors. They came out and their performance wasn't, um, super strong right away. Uh, it's gotten a lot better over time. It, it was initially very difficult to package them in a format that would be resilient. And basically there's three numbers that really matter for this, right? 
the, the two main ones are how much current it can carry before it kind of like craps out and, and becomes a normal conductor. And then also how much magnetic field can it live inside? How much can it withstand? Both those things affect its ability to superconduct. So they're kind of like the performance envelope, right? You can kind of think of it like that. Um, yeah, so, you know, like an, an, a motor performance envelope is kind of like its RPM versus its torque, right? So at h- high RPM, you have low torque. At low RPM, you have high torque. Same with this stuff. At high fields, low current. At low current, uh, sorry, at high current, low fields, right? They trade off against each other. So um, we've gotten better at that over time. And the thing, you know, indeterminate with any new material is really, well, how good can it get over time? So the, the way to think about it, I would suggest is, given its engineering performance envelope, where would be the applicable areas you could use this? Okay, so there's kind of three cases. Um, first is like, you know, low current, low field, right? So very delicate, sensitive material. So there it would only really be applicable in things like, you know, a lot of microelectronics applications, a lot of electronic sensors, I think would also make sense. Um, you know, like there's this, an integral part of a lot of quantum computer design, something called the Josephson junction, which is like a small loop of superconducting material. And a current travels in a, in a loop around that. And then there's some kind of bridge where the current is tunneling across that gap or that bridge, this resistive bridge. And, and, and it's like a fundamental building block. It's kind of like a diode or a logic gate equivalent for normal circuits. So people build stuff out of that. Um, but that would be a low current, low field application, right? Um, another thing is like, so really small antennas for like, you know, IoT devices and Bluetooth and cell phones. As you make those antennas smaller and smaller, the limitation on their ability to pick up signals comes down to what you call the surface resistance, which is like how much resistance is there in the surface of the copper. And so if you could eliminate that, you can get smaller and smaller antennas that would also be more sensitive. So that's, again, that's very low current, low signal, like like low low field, right? Um, and I think a similar you know line of reasoning, so, so those would be easier to make because they're kind of what you call disaggregated. They're, they're separate from the rest of like an integrated circuit, right? So they're kind of like a standalone piece that could like be put on a, on a PCB board or it could be its own little board, like an antenna. Um, another application though, much harder, bigger lead time is to start building integrated circuits directly out of the material itself. And that's that's like the kind of the biggest win, right? But it's the hardest to make right because silicon wafer production process is highly optimized, right? TSMC, their billion dollar machine, it's, you know, it's like this 300 millimeter CMOS wafer fabrication process. It's super advanced. It's really, really optimized. And so it's very tough to just like fit a new material substrate into that and make it work at a performative level. That being said, you know, long term, you could probably catch up. And where that would get you is pretty incredible. So like one of the biggest limitations on com- compute density, like why can't chips just be cubes is removing all the waste heat, right? So a superconductor doesn't lose energy to waste heat. So you could make them 300 times more energy efficient. These are numbers I looked up. It was a study looking at an exascale computer. So just it's, it's you know, for one example, might not be representative for all sizes of chips, but Exascale computer, 300 times more power efficient, 10 times faster, and it's like chip refresh speed. So definitely some big wins there. Um, and that's that. And so, yeah, the low field, low current is like a really big win, like, like you know, all of computing and sensors. And then as you increase the field and the current carrying capabilities, you kind of unlock new applications. Like you still have those base case, but the next one is really looking at things like power transmission, right? So high current, but maybe low field because the wire's in a straight line. That's still huge. That saves like... 50-ish nuclear reactors worth of power loss in the United States every year. Um, I I was surprised by the energy loss, like from a power generation origination to like end user is often like 60% plus. So even if we just replace- Six zero? Six zero. Oh, that's big. Um, The numbers I had seen were- five to seven percent or maybe up to five to twelve percent something like that for transmissions just carrying it but i think you're right in that Uh, there's also lots of losses yeah in like the transformers which like step between voltages and also the generators which are like you know turning the turbine that generates electricity too so i think yeah maybe full full system losses are pretty huge yeah i'd imagine they get worse the closer they get so from nuclear you know power plant to like my iphone is like the the biggest steps down are probably you know between between the actual grid and the phone um but and that's huge so even just replacing a few of those intermediate steps with zero resistance things could 
theoretically, not that there still won't be, but like immediately one thirds the cost of energy without building anything else, just with our existing sort of base load. It, it does a cool couple other things too, right? Which is it. Um, so now, yeah. So now bigger applications. Yeah. You get like more efficient generators. So they take less material. So they're smaller, right? Smaller footprint. And that's like the thing that you turn that generates electricity. Like it could be a turbine, nuclear plant, coal plant, whatever. It's all the same kind of generator idea. Um, you can also so do we things strongly like prefer nuclear around here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm super <laughs> provision guy. You know, funny, actually, my uncle was one of the founders of Greenpeace, which is like a big uh, anti-nuclear Whoa. organization worldwide, right? Yeah, in Vancouver, yeah. British awkward, Columbia, awkward it was founded in Kits- Kitsilano. Well, I mean, they were against nuclear bomb testing, which I think was the right call. Um, and then I think they kind of expanded scope over time. So I'm not going to comment on that, but just a funny anecdote. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Right. So you can do kind of interesting things that are counterintuitive. Like right now, solar panels, energy is always local, right? Because transmission losses suck. And so no one wants to run it too far, but like, why not have solar power in the desert that's powering New York, right? So you can, you know, there's no losses along the way. So you can, you can, and there's another thing too, like reactor efficiency in terms of like material cost versus power wattage output, it gets better as it gets bigger, right? So you can just build like super giant centralized nuclear power plants that just spread out everywhere and power everything instead of like tiny plants everywhere. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. That's the middle bucket is a, is a lot of like power transmission, power generation, that power transmission. So, so generation, actually a lot of that requires high fields too. So then now you go into the high field bucket. Okay. So, so rough numbers, first bucket was one and a half trillion. I did the math earlier. These are 2022 numbers, very rough approximations. Um, middle bucket was, I think, 750, 500 billion, like five, five to 750, I can't forget. Third bucket was another one and a half trillion or and one trillion like or so. Annualized GDP increases? Or in yes, those no, these are total adds. market sizes for those markets. Oh, okay. So, okay. you know, it wouldn't replace the whole market, but like it's the size of the market it taps into, right? So maybe you get 20% of the market if selling the components into it or something or, or something like that. So, so now high strength, sorry, high currents, high field applications. Now we're talking like, yeah, fusion reactors. Okay. Like maglev trains, MRI, medical imaging, right? All those require high field and high current. You might be thinking, by the way, we have two variables. We should have a two by two matrix of applications. And so why is only three cases, right? Well, basically it's hard. You can't really have high field without high current, you know, because the fields induce currents. And, and so that's a harder state to access you can have high current with low field because the wire is straight so it only has itself field which can be small but if you make a coil out of that it experiences its own field but making coils is how you make magnets so nuclear fusion is something that would be greatly enabled by this power generation trans- power transformers maglev trains mris medical imaging in general yeah. um let's let's dive a little more into fusion because that's what you're working on right now right yeah that's right Cool. Are, are we making progress on that? Like, are we going to have fusion? Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic on that. Uh, it is something that we've had consistent progress with over time, right? We, we're not looking at this point for like, you know, a kind of deus ex machina salvation breakthrough in any one area. It's sort of, we're within reach of like steady improvements with what we have currently. And a lot of that was enabled by the HTS magnets that we have today. Like, like, you know, who would have thought, right? But so, so that, that high temperature super discovery from the eighties, that's why we have magnetic confinement today, right? Confinement fusion companies is because now we can have like, like superconductors that exist in like 10 Tesla fields carrying like a thousand amps per square millimeter, which is crazy. I mean, maybe not both those numbers at the same time, but, um, those kinds of limits of performance are really impressive and they work with liquid nitrogen, which was the huge breakthrough. So um, that's made it way cheaper. Otherwise, you have to lose liquid helium, which is like way more expensive, way rarer. You know, nitrogen is like 80% of the atmosphere. Um, so that's been really exciting. There's a whole, there's three general classes of companies, you know, magnetic confinement, like tokamak accelerators, it's kind of like the plasma donut. There's companies that are called magneto inertial, which are like collapsing two plasma gas balls together. Like, so general fusion used to work there. They're, they're trying that. Um, Tri Alpha Energy has that kind of design. Helion has a similar thing where they're compressing them, you know, together. 
um, but starting with plasma. And then there's inertial confinement, which is using like solid fuel pellets, trying to compress those, usually with laser light. Although some companies that are using more like uh, different kind of shock impact methods, like this first light fusion in the UK. Um, so it's it's cool because there's really like a zoo of different reactor types out there and they all have different trade-offs, right? They all have different advantages and, and stuff. So it's kind of like a cool, you know, it's like, uh, it's like the 50 states, right? It's like each one has a little different government, kind of, and you kind of see which one you want to go be part of, right? <laughs> and, and you moved from... You moved to the uh, to the plasma donut. I went more donut. Yeah, I went more donut. Yeah, funny enough. So now I work with Stellarators, which are uh, sort of like somehow the lesser popular magnetic confinement type donut type. Um, if you look historically in the United States, like maybe ninety ish or more percent funding has gone towards tokamak development, and for good reason, right? They they um, they're easier to design. They're easier to operate. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. So Stellarators were actually invented first, right, in the 50s at Princeton. Um, but the first ones they made had really bad efficiency, or bad performance, right? And people were trying other things, field reverse configuration, Z-pinch. There's companies now pursuing those, by the way, in more modern updated forms. But there's kind of a few different designs floating around in the States people are trying. And none of them are really working that great, you know? Um, and then the, the Russians, I think it was 56 or so, they kind of published their data on Tokamax, which was their design. And it just it just smoked everyone else. It was just like, look, these are crazy. People didn't believe the numbers. The Russians invited them over. It was kind of like a good thawing of relations, I guess, um, in some ways. And um, everyone in the States just switched to pretty much Tokamax. Tokamax are bust, really. Um, so that, that drew a lot of attention for a long time. Now, you know, Tokamax are are really well researched, really well developed. Like Eater in France is going to be the world's largest. It's $35 billion, you know, total like civilization scale engineering, right? Like totally insane, like dozens of countries. Um, Eater, Eater is funny, actually. You know, 1986 is going to come up a lot in this uh, podcast, I don't know why, but I think that was the year Reagan met, I think Gorbachev in Reykjavik, Iceland, right? And uh, they wanted to have some kind of project that would that would improve relations. And that's, that's where Eater was born, right? Um, yeah, kind of funny. Um, yeah, and that was, you know, that was a that was a collaboration point scientifically, right? Because they had now a couple decades of tokamak collaboration, right? So this is, you know, f- fusions bringing the countries together, fusions thawing the fusing cold war, the right? Countries. Oh, yeah, all right. Fusing, yeah. fusing our <laughs> worldviews. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, you can edit that out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I won't. We love bad jokes yeah, around here. <laughs> hell no. Yeah. Okay. But so, so really cool stuff on this fusion front. Um, you know, Stellarators, so they had kind of fallen in the backseat for a long time. And then also in the 80s, I think it was the later 80s, um, this guy, Alan Boozer, came out with like a new theoretical model of Stellarator plasma, right? A, a, of a model of looking at this plasma in this totally different frame of coordinates, but that it would exploit key symmetries. And that started off this whole kind of gold rush in the field. Um, in a sense, because people now could, could think, wow, like this would perform even better than a tokamak, right? Um, and that's the kind of allure, right? So the quick, the, the classic thing, tokamaks, easier to design, harder to run. Stellarators, harder to design, easier to run, right? Tokamaks are pulsed operation, meaning they're kind of turning on and off, okay? Like a four-stroke engine is like, you know, only quarter of the strokes is like detonating fuel. So, and then Stellarator is more like a steady state thing. It's more like a, like a furnace, like the fire keeps burning. It's constantly producing energy and it's less liable to disruptions. Disruptions are when the plasma kind of goes haywire inside the reactor. It's, it's pretty wild. So in Eater, I think it's about, so, so Eater's this donut. You can think of this current as traveling in a loop around the donut, like a racetrack. And that has tons of stored energy, right? So it's about 60 megajoules in Eater, I believe something like 15 mega amps of current. And when the plasma disrupts, it kind of becomes unstable, right? Imagine you're like balancing a broomstick on your palm. And once it starts to fall a little bit one direction, it keeps falling faster and faster. So it's very unstable. Um, when that disrupts, it, it disrupts in the form of this beam of current slamming into the wall. And it's like, you know, it's like 60 sticks of dynamite, right? So it can like melt a solid block of steel, like no problem, right? Like vaporize it, really. Um, so the inside of tokamaks are often armored with like tungsten tiles, you know, it's like they, they're serious. Look at, look at these inside photos. It's actually super cool. Um, 
fusion in general, it's one of those like total badass areas of engineering that I feel very fortunate just to get to be a part of in any small way, um, where it's the extreme limits of engineering all brought together in once, right? You have, you know, plasma from a hundred mil- like a million degree plasma, right? You have like neutronics, radiation, like neutron particles being generated or radiating the stuff. You have like massive magnets, magnetic fields. Okay. You have cryogenic systems, vacuum chambers. You have all these crazy esoteric plasma diagnostics, right? It's very hard to tell what's going on plasma. It's just this big smoke ring glowing hot lasts for a millisecond or whatever. You use like lasers, you shine lasers at it. You take like, you know, measuring the rotation of magnetic fields and polarization. And, you know, it's all these, it's really cool. Something people don't know about actually. So a lot of these reactors use what's called a neutral beam injector, right? What the hell is that? Well, it's a particle beam that basically blasts fuel in there, right? So how do you, how do you like, you know, you shovel coal into a furnace, right? How do you load a fusion reactor? Obviously you use a particle beam, right? Of course, it's just the coolest thing ever. Um, but the funny thing is these particle beams, these neutral beams, they're so giant, they're massive. They're like as big as the device itself. Like you, you, they don't get any attention. Um, I, I've worked on a, so I actually used to work in accelerator physics, like more accelerator engineering. So that's like radio frequency acceleration systems and you know vacuums and cryogenics. And it's all a similar, uh, it's a similar tech stack as fusion actually, you know, kind of like skills wise. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's some cool overlap. Yeah. You've had a few interesting things. You had a stint in, uh, bio as well, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, that was wild. Boy, I tell you what, (laughs) uh, yeah. So I don't know if I'm, I don't know if like right guy, right place, right time sometimes, but a couple of times things have happened that seemed like coincidental. Um, yeah. So 2019, me and some friends, we, we tried our first little attempt at a startup together. Like we didn't really like, go big or anything, but you know, some friends working on this cool project and it was like kind of for a fry racing team that we thought was super cool. And it was like, you know, we're just like, whatever. And before that I had mostly done like applied physics research. Right. Um, so it's a cool look at a new world of startups and entrepreneurship. Um, the, the company didn't, didn't quite take off. It was kind of like too much of a science project, not much of an engineering, you know, uh, project, right? So that's not the kind of company you want to have because it can, can, can take forever, right? Um, so I was like thinking what to do. It was in Vancouver. I was like, you know, I, I was supposed to work. I was supposed to go actually work at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, okay? Which is where NIF is. And I was going to work on this laser system. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool. Like I met this um, really brilliant scientist there and she was, we were in touch for a while. And it's a field of called laser wake field acceleration, right? So laser wake, so what, what is that, right? So it's like the next generation of particle accelerators, right? Is using a plasma as the accelerating chamber. And it's kind of crazy. It's like basically wake surfing, right? Like behind a boat, right? So a boat tows a person and the person's riding the wave behind it. This is like, instead of the boat, it's like a late, it's a laser beam. And the person surfing is a bunch of electrons. And you blast this, it's just like, this is nuts, right? I can't believe it's real. You blast the plasma with a super powerful laser pulse, like, like, T- crazy amount of like, you know, petajoules instantaneous power or, or petawatts instantaneous power. Um, and I mean, the actual energy might be like 10 joules or 20 joules, which is a lot for laser pulse, like holy crap, right? Um, and then trailing just behind it is the electron bunch and, and you get energy transfer effectively from the laser to the electrons. So this is crazy because it means particle accelerators could be like, I don't know, 200 times shorter or like, like 20 times shorter. And, and we need that to hit higher energies in fundamental physics, right? So CERN is amazing. CERN, you know, found the Higgs boson, right? Um, the next generation of proposed accelerators are like, you know, a hundred kilometers long, right? To get to the next energy level. So it's really crazy. Um, so where was I? Okay. So I was going to join. Yeah, it's, it's nuts. It's nuts. So these future circular colliders and these international colliders sit, propose things like future circular collider. It makes CERN look like a little quarter next to a basketball. It's like kind of megalomaniac ish, uh, which is, it, I love it. Right. That's great. Um, how else are we going to make black holes? Okay, great. Uh, <laughs> so I was going to join this accelerator lab and I was kind of thinking like, ah, oh, you know, there's just not really much startup space there. Like it's not really like a, you know, whatever. And I saw on LinkedIn, this post for this place, Chan Zuckerberg biohub. And, um, it was the guy that had done the same undergrad as me, not, not the same year as me, but he said, oh, this is great for people from that background. It's kind of multidisciplinary. It's research focused. And so I looked into it and I was like, well, it's in San Francisco, right? And it's infectious disease research. It's a nonprofit. This is 2019. It's October, 2019. 
this sounds great. It's a great pitch. It's building stuff for developing countries, help them find new diseases. I thought that's awesome. And, and, yeah, and, and it gets me to San Francisco, which is just the place to be. And it's also a nonprofit. So kind of like as a hedge, I could, you know, I could, you know, be more research guy after that. I could kind of go into industry. It sort of was, it was a really good bet. And it, it was an amazing place to work. Honestly, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. Like bioengineering team there with uh, Raphael and Paul, these guys were just like, they were just like super engineers. They were just totally, you know, I, I think it was one of the most competent groups of people I've worked with. Like just overall, like everyone there was really top of their game. Um, and then a few months later, the pandemic breaks out and it's like, holy crap. And so suddenly I'm like, you know, with all these like professional biologists and virologists and stuff. And everyone's like, yeah, okay, we're going to like set up this testing lab. That's, you know, like it's a big sprint, it's a big hackathon, right? So seven day hackathon, except instead of like a, you know, whatever B2B SaaS, you come up with like a qPCR testing lab. Um, <laughs> so that was pretty wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, I mean, that was like, that was one of the more interesting, I guess, several week periods of my life where, uh, at, you know, we were in these meetings talking with like regional county health officials, uh, you know, I kind of got roped into some meetings in DC too with similar engineers and doctors trying to figure out really how are we going to make ventilators? Are we going to run out of hospital beds? Like, like if we project the, epi like if you pr project the, the hospitalization numbers kind of statistics from other places onto our local capacity and forecast the shortfall in facilities and equipment, it was drastic. And, and it turned out those, those projections were uh, not as bad as we experienced it in a lot of ways. So we, so that those didn't manifest, but still facilities were massively overwhelmed. So, so yeah, you kind of go from building this lab in seven days. And then Michael Lewis wrote this big piece on it in Bloomberg COVID lab that could save America. It's this dramatic story. It's a great piece. Um, and then after that, we transitioned to building like ventilators. So, you know, digital electronics and a bit of software design, C plus plus and stuff like that. Um, using finite state machines and signal processing to look in real time monitoring breathing patterns as we picked up by like a pressure sensor and detect if they're going into, you know, if they're falling out of sync, if they're outside of some limits. Right. Um, yeah. So that was like, really like, okay, wow, I guess, if, you know, life sciences is pretty important stuff. Um, and then actually, you know, I was there for about two years and then I, and then I tried my first real startup out of there with some friends, actually the same guys from the Ferrari team. Cool. What was that, uh, company? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was called Ada bio. Um, it was super fun. So that was like 2021, you know, I'd been the CCB for a couple of years. There was a lot of talk about thinking big about new projects that would help the organization. And a common thing that had come up in a lot of folks discussions on that was data management. And it was interesting because so life sciences has really advanced a lot, right? Like we're still early days in understanding how to write DNA. Like we, we don't know it at all really, or, or that kind of stuff, but we're kind of learning to cut paste copy commands from CRISPR and we're kind of learning other stuff too. Um, so they have now like single cell sequencing devices. They have mass spectrometry, they have transcriptomics, which like tell you, it's like the stack trace of the cell. Like what are all the proteins being like, what are all the protein programs running at that time? Um, a lot of really cool tech that generates massive amounts of data, right? And it's really hard to organize that. And, and the quick gist is that the experimental design is always changing. So, so every time you do an experiment, it's kind of different, you know? So it's like the data format changes every time too. And this is like a really mundane problem, but it just kills people, right? So it's like, you can't agree on a, on a schema for your data set ahead of time. At the same time, you need to leverage all this information to make like a really informed analysis because it's, it's so much information, right? Um, so the whole point of ADA was like, well, maybe we could use large language models to extract relevant information from all these unstructured text documents. And people can keep working in their messy Google folder collaborations where things are all over the place and in random spreadsheets and random notes to each other and emails and yada, yada, yada. But maybe we could just synthesize and digest all of that, put it into what's called like a knowledge graph, which is a more flexible type of database that basically exists as like a subject object predicate triples, you know, where it's like, I have brown hair, you have a blue shirt, whatever, these things, you know, Samantha did this experiment, John did that experiment, something. Um, and that would be the database, right? So it's super organic, it's adaptive, you can incorporate a lot of different knowledge sources into that. Um, 
that was the kind of dream. I think, I think that the startup, you know, you learn a lot trying to go now into the sales process and working with other companies. You learn about market dynamics and what people like to spend money on and what they don't. Pharma industry, it's just, a, you know, 15 big companies. They like to spend money on di new diagnostics, new ways of getting data, and then new ways of analyzing it, like, like simulations included. So the productivity tool uh, was a tough sell, but learn a lot in the process, right? Learn a lot kind of trying that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then, and then you decided to jump back into nuclear after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, Ada was a great learning experience and, um, you know, lots of, you, you know, the failure mode analysis in a startup is always complex, but learned a lot. Yeah. And um, after really that, yeah, one. it was kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it's always, there's proximate and there's ultimate causes, right? Um, yeah, so then after that, yeah, I was kind of trying to think about what's next. And uh, I was kind of bummed out, like the startup, you know, didn't, didn't work, that kind of sucked. Um, and then thought, well, okay, I mean, I always liked fusion technologies and I just wanted to get back to California. I, had, I was in Canada at the time. I had like a storage locker full of stuff down here. So I wanted to get back to my life, right, in San Francisco. And, and yeah, joined a small company in Redwood City that was building like called beam-driven fusion devices. So you're just accelerating charged particles and causing fusion to produce neutrons. And that was for treating like it's really rare form of early childhood cancer that affects the brainstem. It's inoperable. What you can do though, you can design an adapter molecule that binds to those tumor cells and also carries boron. And boron has a favorable reaction with neutrons. It's called a capture cross-section, has a good capture cross-section. So it'll react with neutrons, form an unstable intermediate isotope, and then radioactively decay. And when it decays, it'll emit high energy particles that destroy the cancering, so it's destroyed the surrounding uh, cancer tissue. Um, so that was cool. So that was like a little 20 person company that was like kind of R and D tech selling, selling mostly to other labs, that kind of stuff. And that was fun. Cause I got to be an engineer again, building stuff with my, you know, back to save lives, radio frequency engineering and Cure plasma cancer. physics and stuff. Yeah. 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 So I had just my little two and a half, three year biotech tour of duty, right? Detour or whatever detour of duty, I guess. Then I'm kind of back to the physics stuff. And I was there for a while and that was, that was a lot of fun. And then, and then, um, someone I worked with at John Fusion got in touch, was like, Hey, um, we're starting a new fusion company. It's based out of Princeton. We're going to make stellarators. And I was like, Oh, that sounds pretty cool. So kind of sign me up for that. That's awesome. Do, do you consider yourself more, more engineer or more scientist? That's a great question. Um, usually scientists have PhDs and I was like, not you know, I've always, I was like debated, Josh, I get the PhD or not. And I, and so I didn't. Right. And so I think like, technically I can't really call myself that. Then again, I've met lots of people. I met lots of people at Stanford linear accelerator who had the job title engineering physicist. And, um, I was like, oh, that's cool. How'd you get that job? I'm like, oh, it's just, my degree is called engineering physics. And, um, that's the name of my degree too. Right. So, you know, I've had that job title before. I think it's a badass job title because it's just kind of both in a sort of ambiguous way. But I'm, I'm definitely not like a real theoretical physics guy. And, you know, I'm really way more of an engineer. But I, I guess I'm an engineer that's always worked in experimental scientific settings. So you, you get, you know, you kind of are in that environment anyway. I think one thing I've done maybe badly is I, ha I haven't optimized for a lot of publications over the time. You know, I have now a few patents and stuff like that. But not a lot of like academic journal submissions. So probably, so that's, that's, and that's usually like, you know, scientists do that, right? So I probably identify more engineer a lot, but definitely like kind of research and development engineer and in, in these experimental kind of capacities. Yeah. I think that's an interesting, like, uh, academic scientist versus like, versus scientist, general populist scientist is like a very interesting distinction. And I think like an important one to make, right? Um, anybody who's like developing new stuff or replicating things it's, it's kind of a fine line like it's not just theorists with phds who are scientists right i see that you know it's just, this is funny right like so yeah this is the thing you see a lot in these kind of fields where it's like are you good at math like you asked me that and i think oh no man like my buddy from school he went <laughs> to get a phd in pure math at oxford and he's now like on a, on the road to be a math professor like that guy's good at math so I think I'm probably not that good at math, but yeah, no, maybe generally speaking closer to science than, than I think maybe a lot of folks in that very much reading journal articles and thinking about them and uh, that kind of stuff. So, so, so in that sense, science adjacent, but scientists in my mind, it's like, 
you're running a lab, you're principal investigator, you have research grants, you have postdocs, you have grad students, you have, this is to me, the kind of science archetype. So, so yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So that's just a context uh, definition for you. Like to, to me, I, I think from my perspective, you're a really important, you sit in the middle of like, you're the very important overlap of the Venn diagram of engineering and sort of science, meaning like you are the, you are the person who develops new technology and like pulls something from the realm of like just barely possible into, hey, look, we built it. And the, the more people that do that, the faster they do it and the better they do it. Like that's where, that's where improvements for civilization actually are actualized in like that process. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, I'm flattered to hear that. I mean, that sounds great to me. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I experienced it that way. I would say to solve engineering problems, I'm frequently reading things in research literature from the last few years, right? So it's sort of, there's very much this translation application component, um, which is great. Pe other people do the hard work of discovering the thing and I just read it, read the results. Awesome. It's a little bit like the cook and the chef, you know, like there's, there's probably <laughs> for every hundred engineers, there's probably less than 10, maybe less than five that are they're on that frontier of trying to engineer something that has never been done before versus like, oh, we're trying to like build a small engine with like a slightly different mix of trade-offs and scale than has been done before, right? Um, so in the broad world of engineering, I think you're really still close to a frontier. That's, that's yeah, I like to think like that too. That's for me always been what's interesting. And that's, I think, the strength of this kind of engineering physics education. And that's like actual a name of degrees called engineering science. But the whole point, the whole kind of ethos behind there, it's like, Look, there's a lot of applications where the design rules don't apply because it's not as well studied. If you're designing like a gear, a gear train, right? There's a lot of design formulas to follow that'll predict failure stresses, failure modes, lifetime reliability, that kind of stuff. Um, and so it's it's kind of like the whole point is, well, what are the physics principles behind those design rules? So I can extrapolate to application areas that haven't been tested before. So that's where it's like understanding the physics. You know, you don't need to push the frontier of physics and string theory. And that's maybe actually a totally different skill set, but like understand the physics intuitively so that you can operate with a design intuition and an eye for a good design in a challenging environment that has many things going on at once, right? high electrical currents, strong magnetic fields, super high temperatures, cryogenics, radioactivity, like this is fusion, right? It's like five or six dis physics disciplines unto their, unto their own, right? Like they're, they're all specialties. So you gotta learn enough to be useful. You gotta learn enough to know what the first and second order considerations are, you know, um, which I think is fun. So maybe that's one thing I've always really enjoyed is jumping into different topics and kind of diving into them and trying to see how they work. And then I would say the third part with the science engineering thing is, is understanding the, the market dynamics that can determine whether your amazing breakthrough actually gets used by people. Right. And that's like part psychology, part e economics too. Right. Yeah. I was just going to do that segue. Cause you had another great tweet that I pulled in here to my notes. Economics is simply where psychology meets physics. It would be difficult to understand the trajectory of technology without all three. Oh yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody's I'm glad you like that. that. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's a good. Um, well, I think it's so easy to turn a like have a blind spot in in one of those, and um, I've been increasingly sort of like uh, not troubled, but just like thinking about why people don't. It's like we were talking about at the beginning of the show, like this this like assumption that things aren't getting better, or the belief that we won't have next the next breakthrough or that miracles aren't happening around us constantly and as you point out like you have to have fluency across a wide array of disciplines or at least see the synthesis between them to appreciate that yeah yeah i really agree with that um so my my very very first time i went to university I actually studied sociology and economics right so then i was gonna i was gonna be a lawyer that was my plan and I kind of like got close to law school and I kind of thought deeply about that and met lawyers and just, I think some people are really passionate about it and love it. And that's, I can see the puzzle and the challenge there. And I think for me, it was at the time I was just like, you know, I just way more into the science and tech stuff. So I think, you know, if you spend way too much time in school, you get to, you get to learn things that you don't use every day, but 
maybe get the to write witty tweets or something. So that, that paid off. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just kidding. Um, but I, I do agree with, so the point I was trying to make there with like this, uh, economics is the transmission where the wheels meet the road of our driving society through the world. You know, we have rules of governance. We have the way we want to work things and how much parking should cost, but also what, how, you know, yada, yada, yada. Right. And we have to interface with material reality and eat food and be warm and produce clothes and stuff like that. And so economics is that transmission where we have like, or it's the engine and transmission, I guess. Like if you drive badly, you know, you'll crash into a tree and societies have driven badly in the past. If you look at them, like that's like the cold war wasn't won by like space lasers and tank armies and stuff. It was won by like full supermarkets and grocery stores and, and Michael Jackson's eight tracks and blue jeans kind of stuff, right? Like the productive wealth of the economy when it's under stewardship that is, uh, well adapted to providing to its people. And that's, and, th and that's sometimes it kind of comes down to the physics of stuff. Like you have to produce more energy than you consume. Okay. That's just like the simplest. Thing. That's why I'm so pro nuclear. You look at like energy ROI, like how many megawatts, megawatt hours to produce a megawatt hour or a megawatt hour of solar energy. And it's like four to one and nuclear is like 50 to one or something, 40 to one. It's like, same with materials costs, all this kind of stuff. Like it makes sense on that basis. So there's a physics fundamentals to economics, but there's also this weird psychology behavioral component where people are trying to think about what's fair, what's right. Like, I don't think we want to live in a physics first universe because it's pretty cutthroat and it looks a lot like sort of fascism or totalitarian or something like that. Like it looks pretty terrible. So you, you have to have some understanding of like charitable compassion and acknowledgement of different circumstances and, and everything. So so there's always a balance of like, uh, yeah, this kind of, I'm not going to get the politics of that, but I'm just going to say, you know, technology, right? Uh, it's totally, it's, it has to be physically viable and produce economically good functions. But then sometimes it doesn't like beanie babies, right? Like what's the ROI on a beanie baby versus the fusion reactor? And why do people spend a billion dollars on beanie babies and not fusion energy? Like, <laughs> It's yeah, it's hard to quantify joy. Um, uh, but that, that's like a we we have orbited like my my current rough draft of like the thesis of this show, which is like with technology, capitalism, and friendship, like all will be well. Like that's what makes the world go round. That's what makes life good and worth living. I agree with that, man. I I quick comment on that. I used to study sociology, and it was all Marxism all the way, like all Marxism all the time. And, um, you know, it kind of gives you a certain mindset and very critical of capitalism. And there's lots of things to improve. But I think now I really think of it like, what is the profit incentive? Like, sure, it has many forms, but the, it's the fundamental physics equation that the total value coming out of an area of activity has to be bigger than the value of stuff going in. And so long as that equation holds, the value of stuff increases over time. And that's just like so basic. It's so simple. That doesn't explain all profits and not all the right things are profitable according to certain rules, but that's what I think of as like a good principle. Yeah. And things get muddier with, with subsidies and, and things like that too. So we, we've managed to make a very complex system out of a simple fundamental formula, but. Well, you, you can't get to the right places sometimes without subsidies, right? To overcome this initial, not every technological enterprise is Q1 profitable, right? And most of the best ones aren't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I've heard of one yet. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Beanie Babies were. <laughs> Q1 profitable? I haven't, I, 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 you know, I haven't studied that as a technology enterprise yet. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know if that's a term. I just made it up. But you know what I mean? Like, it's, is it, does it make money? Because yeah. Fusion is a 10-year bet. It's a 10-year bet, right? So it's 2035 is when all these companies are what, trying okay. to get on the grid. Yeah. I mean, it, it, and that seems, uh, that seems like a realistic timeline for you as a kind of front lines engineer at the moment. Um, looking at like the performance improvements over time in the field, like if you just kind of draw the line out, then it's, it's actually reasonable in terms of magnetic confinement energies, that kind of stuff. Different approaches to fusion have different degrees of scientific risk. I would say magnetic confinement really has just engineering risk. It's a matter of design and testing stuff, but the science is, is way more de-risked than other branches of fusion. Yeah. I mean, that's huge. That, that is, um, I know we had some big headlines over the last couple of years about fusion, but it's still the, uh, the non, uh, tech focused people that I talk to are kind of like, oh yeah, that's not real or it'll never happen. Or, 
like and it, so it's what it was one of those things is like always 20 years away um hey, we, we turned it on for a millisecond at at like net negative energy cost it's like not quite uh but but we don't see the progress that you see from the outside right so um i mean 10 years is awesome and this could be a really cool couple decades oh yeah for sure totally and i think like it's such a long run bet um, the first reactors will be expensive and difficult to produce. But what you're doing is you're getting an unlimited fuel supply forever. You get the fuel out of seawater, you dig it out of the ground. It's like a lot of the fuel types are very abundant materials and they have a similar energy density as stuff like uranium and plutonium, which are toxic and hazardous and harder to extract. Um, so it's, 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 it's like the last energy source humanity will ever need. Yeah. F fusion is, um, I mean, people talked about the holy room temperature semiconductors is like the holy grail of material science. And yeah, super, fusion. super conductors. Oh, so, yeah, sorry. Super. I've, I've not done those that like mid conductors in the last we don't, three weeks. Not room temperature <laughs> mid conductors. Forget those. Boo, super conductors. <laughs> uh, and fusion, like the holy grail of energy production. And um, I don't know, like we can keep riffing on sort of the like, industrial revolution the next industrial revolution forming between these things um so I, I think we had a note to come back to quantum computers on that list also oh yeah um on, yeah i'm like i'm not i'm not yeah i'm not an expert in that at all but i think it's a really awesome i was very close to joining a um the quantum computing group at santa barbara with google google quantum right like it's their hot shot research laboratory campus um, they were looking for someone that had like superconducting radio frequency materials experience. And I had a bit of that from particle solder stuff, but I ended up doing the fusion thing instead. Um, quantum computers are super crazy. I think, so there's a, it's a really specialized machine, right? So it's not going to be useful for every class of problems, but the kind of things it is good for would just beat everything else completely. And, and it's like fundamental. Um, in my mind, I think one of the strongest use cases is this searching the mountain range for gold in both material science and also life science. Because a lot of those come down to this kind of solving a many body problem. And so exploring a really high dimensional space of possibilities really effectively. And that's, and that's the sort of fundamental quantuminess of a, of a cute quantum computer. That's I think one of its strengths sometimes um, is that it can do this exploration and it takes a million years with this computer and it takes like a day with that one. Or, that's, a, that's an exaggeration. That's not like a direct attempt to quote or anything. Um, I'm just going to qualify, man. Everyone's on me these days. LK99 stuff. Yeah, yeah. Watch out for the LK99 truthers, man. They're out there. They're going to never stop giving up on that. Um, but yeah, the quantum, quantum computing is... Uh, I think that would be a real unlock. Like, because you could, you could... That's like, okay, like with that working, you could find amazing materials, right? This class of materials called quantum materials which is really cool it's basically surfaces and materials where quantum mechanical effects start manifesting at like a macroscopic scale right and the kind of things that superconductors also things like invisibility cloaks right like a material you could wrap around you and light hits it and it just magically comes out the other side and it's just completely invisible um tell me other... about invisibility cloaks right now like that's a legit I, that's a legit thing it's that's like a legit look, like if, physical possibility yeah totally yeah that's quantum so materials awesome. quantum materials super wild there's other kinds of abilities that are, seem magical to us because they're large-scale manifestations of phenomena we have no intuition for which is quantum mechanics and it's things like you know super hyper efficient catalyzing membranes or something like that like say say I, say i'm running a fusion facility and i want deuterium and it normally sucks to get this out of seawater, but here I'm just going to pour seawater over the screen and all the deuterium like falls through or something like that. I mean, I'm kind of making that up, but um, that's the kind of goal of this quantum materials stuff. Actually, one of the first labs I worked at was at UBC called the Quantum Matter Institute, which sounds super fancy. I was not, I was not, you know, I was a very junior guy there, right? Just, just doing whatever kind of engineering stuff. But yeah, I've, I've been, my adult self has been surprised to find out how many institutes is just like two guys in their living rooms. Well, so they were a real institute. They had a, they had a big budget. They had real world-class facilities, um, all kinds of condensed matter physics experiments and, you know, like a dozen research groups with different labs and stuff. So no, they were for, for, for real, but I was not a scientist, right? Just to be clear, I was an engineer, junior engineer. <laughs> 
what what kind of stuff did uh were they working on um so the group i was working with was um actually looking in, you know ostensibly into room like high temperature superconducting effects in like a certain class of materials but they also worked on a lot of other things like organic photovoltaics and so a lot of like material properties things like trying to tune energy levels in the material to respond just right for a specific performance application you know um it's kind of cool how that works like so the machine that makes it possible it's called a scanning tunneling microscope right and what the hell is that so you can kind of think of it like you know imagine you have a super sharp knife right and the knife if you look at it really close up it's actually like thousands of atoms wide or millions of atoms wide. Like the sharpness kind of sucks. You know, obsidian is really good as like a medical scalpel because it's even sharper at the small scale. But imagine a knife that was perfectly sharp, right? It was sharp down to a single atom. So at the atomic scale, it's like one atom and then the next layer say has two and then four or whatever, right? So an atomic, like a scanning time microscope is basically that perfectly sharp knife point just hovering over material. And what happens is, you know, electrons are distributed in space, meaning they're not completely localized. Their quantum mechanical properties and such means that they can't be localized. It's the uncertainty principle in some sense. Um, and so there's this wave function, you know, the wave function describes where it is in space. So think of it just the cloud, probability cloud. The probability cloud of the super sharp knife overlaps with the probability cloud of the material you're trying to figure out how it works. And so you get this tunneling between them, right? Electrons will teleport these short distances and, and quantum tunneling, quantum teleporting is a cooler name. Um, it's also something that happens like in our own sort of enzyme catalyzed reactions and so forth, certain metabolic pathways or cellular functions, like it's operant at that scale in, in very specific areas that kind of written into, it's kind of cool. So it's part of living creatures as well, but it is a very tiny, tiny phenomenon. So it's not on the scale of big molecules. It's on the scale of like atoms next to each other. Um, so the scanning microscope, what you do is you have these, clouds overlapping and so it means like you know it's the ufo with the light coming down the teleportation link is established and then what you do is basically change the strength of that levitation beam to see what stuff you can lift off and by that i mean you change the voltage applied to the microscope tip to see how much current tunnels out of the material and if you get lots of current at a certain voltage it means you have electrons at that energy level um so this is a way you can kind of probe electronic structure um and by, and uh, yeah, so it's it tunnels current and it scans energy and it can also scan in like a 2D grid all over the place. And so that whole facility laboratory it had to be like super isolated from vibrations, right? So it was in this big anechoic chamber on these like isolation blocks and stuff. And there's like secondary stages of isolation, vibration stuff. So it's, you know, like if a car drove, like if a truck drove by outside, like you, you wouldn't be able to use it. You get the best measurements at night kind of stuff. And so I was looking at the time into like how to damp out some of the acoustic modes in the room, right? So just try, like the room is a resonator. It has a fundamental note, just like a pipe organ based on the dimensions. And so any sound energy inside can get damped out quite well, except for the resonant modes. And so that can like shake the machine more and that's kind of stuff. So it's kind of first exposure to like, oh, wow, this is like some super uh, cool physics stuff. And um, I was very happy to be there. Um, I, I wasn't, you know, I was almost going to go just teach English in Taiwan, actually. That was like my, that was like what I was going to do. I was like, oh, I don't want to be a lawyer anymore. I should just do something else. <laughs> and then my friend Ben gave me a tour of the lab there. And I was like, this is the coolest thing ever. Oh, my God. So cool. So I'm glad I didn't do the English thing. Oh, my God, dude. Yeah, dude, let me be probably not the first or last to say thank god you are neither a lawyer nor teaching english in taiwan because <laughs> the world needs all of the engineering physicists it can get um, and I'm, i will sleep better at night knowing like a dude like you yeah. was working on fusion oh my god and tweeting about don't super say that that's gonna make me stressed out that's gonna make me not want to relax and stuff i don't want that burden. no no i mean relax chill but like also have a bunch of kids and like tell everybody how to you know like inspire the children the youth of america to like become more like you that would be great oh wow um, if we could clone you know. if you could figure out how to clone yourself and then like i don't think you know me that you well working on Let's different projects that <laughs> 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 i don't know if you want everyone to be more like me actually i'm, I'm going to question uh, that but i appreciate the okay. sentiment i think for sure on the <laughs> physics and engineering totally totally well that's um, all i know so yeah, far let's get yeah, more of those uh, yeah
fair enough yeah fair enough um look, I, I just watched oppenheimer like we got flawed characters all over the place you know building great it's true. stuff changing the world yeah so yeah no yeah yeah totally no judgment uh, yeah san francisco has a real interesting ecosystem of characters like that yeah it's very yes, it very does. funny yes it does um okay let me let me uh summarize to some extent maybe um the superconductor sort of thing we've talked about over a bunch of different kind of methods but um my summary trying to kind of wrap my head around this in the big picture of of sort of civilization societal technological change is like uh if this is real which is a thing we can sort of come back to the current state of um a, a step forward in superconductors means it unlocks things that are currently constrained by energy cost and it unlocks things that are probably currently constrained by compute cost and both of those and we could talk about why are like way broader than people think i'd add a third there which is that it unlocks things that are currently impossible just otherwise like just you just can't do it you just it's just you can't even do it right so it's it's part of it is everything gets better and is cheaper and it's like kind of crazy it's like it's going to use less materials it's going to run faster, higher performance. It's going to use less energy. It's going to be cheaper to make. Okay. All four of those things that you normally can like pick two or something. And it's going to enable fundamentally new things that you can't do otherwise. Like, holy crap. Right. So that's, that's why it's like a real, you know, like kind of a, yeah, I'd say it's a LK99 five spice, really. Those five categories of improvements. Okay. <laughs> that's a, um, something else. I think this is one of your tweets, but on the, on the topic of this, not realizing how much is impacted by decreased energy cost. Um, I think you you said materials like aluminum, half the cost of the input is energy. A lot of times, yep, totally. So one thing on aluminum, it's almost infinitely recyclable. So you can, um, you know, uh, yeah, so that's, that's good. But the extraction of ore and the refinement is incredibly energy intensive, as well as the forming and manufacturing process itself too. So energy is one of those things where it's like, it's like the base price on something, right? If you could think of, think of this way, think of like a really high throughput factory that is, achieves perfect economies of scale, meaning the, co the capital cost per unit produced is zero somehow, amazingly impossible, right? But just suppose it's all robot, fancy stuff, whatever. Von Neumann probes assembled themselves out of the luminiferous ether of our own imagination and formed this factory producing Beanie Babies. And it's amazing, right? Well, the long run cost was Beanie Babies. They're gonna be two things. It's me materials, wrong put of materials, and it's the energy, right? So that's the price floor on stuff is the energy and material cost, right? Um, and now looking at just materials by themselves, like they have extraction refinement. So a lot of metals, it's like double digit percentage of the price when you look at it is the price of energy. And it's tough. It's tough because our energy economy right now is susceptible to these occasional wild price shocks as a result of geopolitical events. And it drives really damaging cycles in the economy, makes it really hard for consumers. You know, inflation is so regressive, right? because it's assets that get inflated relative to dollars. And most people aren't rich in assets, right? Well, only some people, you know, only really wealthy people have tons of assets usually, right? So devaluing cash relative to assets and energy inflation, it's one of the, you know, it's one of the great destroyers of the middle class, I guess, is this inflation stuff. And it's kind of weird because like energy hasn't gotten cheaper in a while, right? Like what's up with that? How is how are we as a species supposed to be crushing it and energy is getting more expensive? Yeah, which which gets maybe too close to the uh, political fire because we said we wouldn't do too much of that. But I there are people. Oh, I mean that's an obvious dude. I mean that's yeah. not politics. That's <laughs> physics, right? That, the physics, that physics says, but they're, don't be an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good bumper sticker uh, <laughs> there's yeah. so many people who believe yeah. that like <laughs> greater energy uh usage is bad and humans should be have less access to energy because it's bad for the environment that's basically what a lot of environmentalism has turned into is kind of like make energy more expensive generate less energy um not realizing that we have they have also slowed down the creation of renewable clean energy that we now have all the engineering to do and that the more energy there is it, it 
to your point, there's no more fundamental measure of abundance than like the cost of energy. The more energy we have, um, the capacity to generate, the cheaper it will get and the cheaper everything else will get. Absolutely everything else. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 100%. Yeah, 100% agree. Yeah. I I wrote this little essay thing. It's on like Substack, if no one, if anyone reads that, whatever. But um, it's this kind of the history of energy, right? And it's like, when did the, ex- the, when did the population boom really happen? And when did our quality of living get a lot better? And it perfectly coincides when, when we started having access to more energy. And if, and if you think big picture, look, fossil fuels is a one-time subsidy for our industrial economy. And if we don't use that to get to an abundant energy future, then we will have squandered that inheritance on political favors and bickering over small fry stuff. And it's not that social problems are small fry. I'm sorry, they are important and we should have those discussions. But what I mean is we are burning the candle at both ends, you know, on this, like if we run out of cheap energy and we haven't gotten to a new abundant, awesome source, nuclear fusion, whatever it could be, you know, orbital solar arrays or unlimited geothermal, any kind of thing, right? Um, we're screwed. That we're screwed, could, man. Yeah, that could be lights out literally you know, and figuratively for all of us. Yeah. Dude, dude, that's right. Like everything gets worse. Like um, quality of living so directly proportional to energy consumption. Um, yeah, 100%. If you have any off the top of your head, I would love to know. But you added a category that was just like also things that are completely impossible today. Um, what are those? I'm I'm intrigued. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, okay. So this is where we go back to that very initial thing, right? Where every product is a combination of things that are available, right? And so the number of new things you get is combinatorial in the capacities you have, right? So, so we're good at looking at all the first order applications of superconductors and energy transmission and cell phone sensitivity and compute speed and that kind of stuff. And, um, and it's hard to really draw out what are the second, third order applications uh, that would be enabled down the road, right? So look at transistors. You know, it's a really, there's a lot of analogies here in some ways where transistors were thought about a lot before they came out and same with like room temperature superconductors. But in transistor, before the, they were invented as a material at Bell Labs, it was like, okay, we use vacuum tubes and they kind of suck. They're big and bulky and they break and all this kind of stuff. Um, they, it's hard to tune performance. They're not ideal. And you know, vacuum tube, transistor, it's basically just a current switch or a current amplifier. It's like, can I use a small signal to control a big signal? So it's like a valve on a pipe basically. Um, and there's tons of ideas of like, what could we do if we had this thing? Oh, we can make all these relays and switches shorter. We could make like maybe an automated telephone system or something like awesome stuff, right? What you can't predict is like, I don't know, large language models or like VR headsets or, or the internet or you know, this kind of stuff. Phones. The internet. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we had we had phones before the transistor, oh, I mean, but I know uh, what you're sorry, saying. Smart smartphones, 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 totally. You know, it's actually super funny. So sci- I, this is one reason I'm a huge science fiction fan. And I think that's kind of been why I got into the things I did professionally is because it was like the, the chance, however small, to work on something that's sci-fi is like so crazy. Um, 1911, this French guy had this cartoon and people have iPhones. And they have hi- iPhones with video screens talking to people, except they have the little earpiece clamshell thing held to their ear, right? So they didn't have the AirPods. They had they had the video. They had the FaceTime without the AirPods. But it needed um, to be visible in cartoon but, but science form, fiction, so that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's like digestibility, right? Like people aren't going to get the, the wireless headset. Um, but I think science fiction is amazing for that thing because it's really trying to imagine boldly, like what are the near term, second, third order impacts in a realistic fashion, or basically, look, change, change the boundary conditions of society, throw in some weird tech, how does everything else readjust and change and stuff like that. And so they've been very anticipatory of future developments. And you look at cyberpunk and the metaverse, right, tie ins, and the personal computing revolution, and even telecommunication satellites were first written about by Arthur C. Clarke, who's a sci fi author, right. So there's a long history of this kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, dude, I think super connected future, I think we can get there. I mean, I'm not, you know, I don't know when it'll happen, but it's uh, such a worthwhile goal. And it's also something that 
we can build the tools to get there faster, right? Too, like computation and experimental throughput. And so there's enabling text, right? Like you don't have to, you don't have to jump the, uh, you don't have to climb the wall all at once, right? So uh, on the topic of second and third order effects, um, we also, it's also hard to imagine sometimes, not just, it's easy to imagine replacing existing technology with a new technology. It is hard to predict the second order effects on the economic side of things as well. Like how market sizes change when things take Mm -hmm. one or two or three orders of magnitude leaps in either quality or price or um, Mm -hmm. anything like that. So I would say like that is, and the feedback loop between these technologies that are all sort of co-developing, you know, the, the exponential can really like take off quickly in some very unexpected ways when, when the feedback loops, we saw this in the, um, there's, there's a great book called where's my flying car that I did an episode on with, with, with the author and my book notes as a separate episode. And he did a really good job of sort of like comparing the previous industrial revolutions and the feedback loop between like internal combustion, Mm -hmm. steel, gas, railroad, telegraph, electrification, all sort of co-developing with, hey, we're going to have nuclear, we're going to have AI, which is going to accelerate the development of nuclear, the decrease in cost of energy and AI are both going to bring sort of uh, nanotechnology much closer, much faster than it had been possible to do before. Um, Superconductors are is another is something I don't remember him talking about specifically, but is another kind of lever of like, mm-hmm. oh, that unlocks stuff. But actually, like, you know, compute might, and AI might unlock the superconductor, which helps us unlock nuclear fusion, which helps us unlock yeah. the right. uh, like nanotechnology, which is actually just like material a godlike power over all material things, um, oh, yeah. which is just insane it, it, it's like civilization five like end game technology yeah yeah and it's like to your point earlier like that seems like absolutely impossible magic we have no precedent for imagining that and it's harder to imagine it, it's hard for a lot of people to imagine you know it was easier to conceive of like air conditioning as an invention that might happen in your lifetime than to believe that we're going to have like you know be able to will you know air into a bowl of food and send rockets to mars like that just seems insane but it's not like we could see it in our lifetimes um if the right steps happen in the right order yeah yeah it's really true so there's this great concept from biology called punctuated equilibrium which is basically tons of species will evolve out of some <clears throat> big event like the kt extinction or, or like the permian trash extinction or the uh, cambrian explosion whatever and you'll have all these new kinds of creatures emerging at the same time based on some big upset. And then things kind of like become more static, right? Like it's like niches get developed and small performance improvements in different animal, you know, business models. Um, and then something else comes along and everything changes all over again. And there's a huge reshuffling, right? So um, I'd recommend another book called, I think it's The Structure of Financial Capital and Technological Revolutions, approximately by Carlotta Perez. I almost yeah, really, thought I might really have that in arm's reach, but yeah, this, that is an incredible book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really does a really good job kind of tracing out. Um, I, 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 I basically agree with the book in large strokes. I mean, look, one revolution enables the next, and now you have railroads, cheap freight. What does that enable? Okay, like international, intercontinental shipping and specialization and more urbanization and, you know, everything builds. And so, you know, it's really fun to think like, what are things enabled by the most recent revolution, right? The IT information revolution. So one of them we're seeing already, right? Which is biotech. And so DNA synthesis and sequencing, just quick story on that. So so the Human Genome Project was like $2 billion to sequence a genome, right? And they were using a sequencing technique called Sanger sequencing, which was expensive and slow. And you're reading, it's like, you know, a thousand page novel, reading it, one line at a time, okay? And now we have this, you know, Illumina has this new sequencing, uh, which is like, I think it's called just, oh, what is it called again? I forget, next gen or something. Um, as a broad class of ideas, but it's different fundamentally. Imagine instead of reading the book in, you know, order, right? You have a thousand copies of the book and you chop them up into random sentences and you read millions of sentences in parallel. 
And then you just look for the joint overlap with really high compute and reconstruct the whole book. And so that's like enabled by computers, like computers being awesome. And so biotech is built on top of the computers. I think our ability to, you know, let me, let me, let me put my cards on the table. Biotech is one of those things where, oh, we think it's like, oh, medicine is great. And uh, we can secure these diseases and get a hair loss treatment. This does whatever. Um, those are important. I don't mean to say whatever. I mean, that's awesome. And, uh, and it's programmable matter, dude. <laughs> it's stuff that grows. It's a von Neumann probe. Like, what's the difference between a, a tree seed and a von Neumann probe? It's like you just put it in the ground. It unpacks from instructions that are the size of a molecule into a really complicated thing, something more complicated than anything we could produce. That's a tree, let alone a, a person and a brain, so forth. So, you know, the ability to design, um, in the language of DNA is, is the programming language of molecules and, and molecular world, right? And so programmable matter, you know, we can invent nanobots the hard way, which is like re-engineering them from semiconductors and stuff. And that's tough. That's really tough. Yeah. But, but evolution has this 4 billion year head start or 3 billion year head start, um, of exploring the possible combinations of molecules. And it's done so massively parallel right in all these different little tide pool experiments and we've come up now with a really optimized complicated byzantine rube goldberg-esque series of interactions and, and things in the body like oh this one molecule yeah it like turns your eyes blue or like causes you to forget something like what like the hell like all the like that's a made-up example but it's so weird these pathways are so hot, interleaved with each other so multiplex there's so much economy of use in a single molecule in the body and all the places it can manifest and show up. And that's why diseases are so weird, where it affects some small cellular me mechanism. And it's like, oh yeah, people always get a cough and a rash on the back of their neck and their knees start hurting. And you're like, wow, okay, I guess those are all related. Um, but having, you know, having a factory that grows out of a, out of a, you know, pumpkin or something, or a, a colony that unpacks from a seed ship, okay? And it just starts growing a thousand years in advance. Like, expanse is great sci-fi, right? Because it's like, what would happen to humans if you had fusion rockets? Okay, great, you could do lots of stuff. And then, and then let's think bigger. Why not just have like von Neumann probe life that you send to a planet and it unpacks into a warp gate or something? I just ruined <laughs> the first season, I'm sorry, but um, yeah, <laughs> you can cut it out. But uh, yeah, so I, I think like biology is kind of underestimated in its ability to be impactful beyond just life science and agriculture. Those are the highest leverage applications now because it's so hard to produce these molecules. And so you need to have like a million dollars per kilogram kind of price or a million dollars per gram, which is true for like antibodies because because the effective dose is so small. It's like micrograms or something would have an impact on someone. So whatever. Um, but at the long term, like learning to speak the language of biology natively through synthetic life or synthetic living organisms, and then your computer heals itself, right? You know, like sweet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so what is your yeah, I, I agree with you though. I, I want to see both us pursue both paths towards sort of like self-replicating nanotech stuff. Um, there's like no reason not to, but the the bio is the bio stuff is amazing. Okay, I mean, okay, I can think of one reason, <laughs> right? The gray goo scenario, just real oh, quick. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, right. we won't that. <laughs> That's like the, uh, yeah. yeah, AI doomerism in, in, you know, in nanotech, it's the gray goo. Uh, what is the, uh, what is the current verdict on the superconductor, sort of like the breakthrough? Like what, how much of a breakthrough do we have? Did we just like, we kicked off a long cycle is everything immediately different? Um, I, I know this has been like a rapidly developing situation. We're recording, you know, probably at least a week before we'll publish. Um, but just your, your your rough estimate and sort of go forward prognostication. Right, 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 right. Well, so the sentiment I think has shifted overall, sort of in the in the public community as well as the sort of academic research community. And academics are a lot better at being reserved, reserving judgment till all the facts come in. <laughs> that was not the, a lot uh, of that happening know, on that's, Twitter. <laughs> that's, a, that's a virtue. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's true. It's true. And I'm sure I'm, I'm probably to blame for that, but I mean, I, I always, I always was very trying to say, Hey, by the way, like this is not confirmed. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you did Let's an amazing, real amazing get, sort of like big picture balance. Mm, um, right. But it's kind of, why is this important? Yeah, yeah, why yeah, do yeah. people care? How does this stuff work? Kind of thing. I think, I think that was part of the story. Um, so, okay. So quick, just there. Yeah. Look, the initial weaknesses that I, the, the good, bad, ugly, the thing I tweeted, they just never got strengthened over time. Like that no one, there was never a replication that came in that really like, oh, that measurement that was missing or kind of bad. Yeah, here it is. We nailed it. There we go. Like, so it just kind of never, the longer those things didn't fail to materialize. Um, and the most obvious one was zero resistance. That's like the biggest deal, right? Like lots, like different stuff floats, right? Not everything good floats. Not all things that float are good. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah. So, you know, the lack of replication confirmation of those findings in the material experiments. And then now, and that, so the, the waves of optimism, right? So the first wave of reactions were simulations, which did point towards this electronic band structure that was promising. And it was in the author's own words, kind of saying, look, this is thought to be enabling of superconductivity in a few different interaction pathways, like a few different mechanisms could be related here. It doesn't predict anything, but it's not ruling it out. So those are the first things to get done. That was the easiest. And then the next were like the visual cues, like videos of it levitating. So those were both positive indicators, right? Like they were, they were not denying it, you know, so optimism could really increase, but then the stuff that takes longer to get done, like the physical measurements and the physical replications start to come out and they were not promising. Like they were not confirming the thing. And then, and then the more difficult thing to get done was like measuring what's actually going on and figuring out what's actually going on. So now those are coming out and they have a very much more mundane explanation of effects. Like this is a, this is basically what you thought was the resistance drop was actually just a phase transition in the material. So the resistance did change, but it never changed to superconducting levels, right? Um, that's the, like, there's still science to be done in this whole theme. So I'm, I'm not going to say it's a done deal for sure. But like, when you think of your, my long tail odds of 5%, 10% being true, and that's 10% of a huge deal. Now it's shifting back down to like 1%, you know, or less. I'm not going to say number to tie myself to it, but just, it does tiff, shift the relative expectation value, I guess. Um, that being said, you know, look, there was a couple interesting things that seemed to surprise people that did the simulations and experiments, right? One was that this doping effect of introducing copper into a lead crystal causes a structural deformation in the crystal. And that deformation produces these otherwise absent, favorably flat energy bands near the Fermi surface, which is like sea level of energy in the material. Um, that's a cool effect. I don't know how well understood that was before. Uh, I'm not a condensed matter physicist, um, but it seemed like that maybe wasn't fully anticipated. Another thing is, here's this material that at room temperature undergoes this phase transition. Maybe there's materials engineering that can be done that would leverage these effects in some way that maybe it's in a different material substrate. These might become parts of your toolkit uh, for thinking of new materials, and it might not be superconductors, it might be other things that, that sort of juries out on that, whether this leads to actually fruitful research efforts. I mean, hey, look, it kind of, well, it could be bittersweet, right? So this could be fruitful, people explore it, come up with new stuff. Hey, here's like this cool transistor design that's better now. We didn't think we'd get there, but we got there by accident. It might also distract people from what they were doing, which was maybe more useful, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. So, but that's always part of the game, right? It's always this random walk through through possible experiments and semi-random, right? It's informed, but uh, yeah. So, I, I'd be interested to see if those things ended up leading to useful research, or or if it really was just a ah, this was a sort of a, a false you know, a false, uh, fool's gold or, or, or something. Yeah. So we, we, we added a leaf to the tree of knowledge, certainly. And hopefully it's something that points us in the direction of something that's like a lot more fruitful, but it doesn't seem like this was, oh my God, we can make really cheap room temperature superconductors now. Um, not, not all leaves, yeah. leaves catch sunlight yeah. either. So whether it's sun's going to shine on this leaf, uh, we'll see. Okay. So where should people go to get more of you? 
follow you, learn from you? Yeah, um, sure. Well, you know, I, I tweet threads sometimes about cool stuff I think is under development. People might not have heard about and, you know, try to tease out, hey, what's the science here? What's the engineering application? And then what's the big deal? right? Like what's, why does it matter? Right. I think that's a kind of a cool trifecta. So I'll try to be writing more on, on Twitter as like the, here's the, um, overview, right. Kind of of the topic, here's the key points, you know, and then I might, I might do more longer pieces on the science behind it. Right. So the Substack part of the section is called the physics of industry. Um, and, and just the first big article there is all about the fusion energy industry. So really, honestly, here, here's the shameless plug. If you want to get up to speed with fusion, read that article because it starts off. Here's the first part, history of energy, why it matters, right? Where it comes from. The second part is just big overview, all the different types of fusion in general, right? Some specific examples, the companies working in them, what are the technological hurdles to those things? And, and you know, what are the pros and cons of different approaches and, and kind of a little bit of how it works. Um, that's a really big topic. And so you can't cover it in exquisite depth. So an expert might be frustrated that some points are glossed over, but it's trying to be an overview for someone that's literate in science and technology, but not like a fusion expert, right? So it's kind of like, what's the first order intuition for things? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know, maybe maybe on your podcast again in the future, right? We'll see. That'd be awesome. Um, yeah, I've had a ton of fun doing this. Um, do you want to it, just in case you weren't enough of a renaissance man between you know bio and fusion and everything um you also host ai salons in san francisco for people oh yeah local, that's right which i think is that's a lot right. of listeners actually yeah totally totally well okay so i mean so i've had a couple little startup attempts and 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 they're really you know it's always easier to start software companies right um it's the laptop and an idea and and i guess like some red bull and a solar in subscription um so ai salon really it's kind of like you know, what are the second, third order social and economic and sometimes philosophical impacts of AI, both as it's currently manifested in large language models, but also in how we think it might get in a few years or even in a longer time horizon. And, you know, there've been a lot of interesting discussions around that. So we've had maybe 10 sessions so far, maybe a few hundred people total have come through the doors on that. And the format, it's, it's a single threaded conversation. So it's just, you know, eight, 12 people to kind of hang out. Usually in my living room, it's, it's the space, but sometimes we get bigger events, 60 people that have like, say, several conversations at once. And people just talk about, you know, how's it going to affect dating relationships, right? And um, loneliness and depression and who needs it for therapy, people are going to want to marry their AI, whatever's, um, or, you know, healthcare and medicine or science. And so different topics every week. It's just, a, it's a fun hobby, right? Me and my friend, Ian Eisenberg run it. So the next session might be too late, but it's transhumanism, you know, so AI ascendance. Okay. So yeah, that's, I linked that on my Twitter bio too. So anyone, just anyone's welcome to join, sign up. We just try to get a good mix of people each time. Um, and, and yeah, we'll, we'll keep doing that for fun. Awesome. I will put your Twitter, uh, front and center in the show notes. So people should absolutely follow you. Um, but taking a tour through your, the, all the threads in your pin tweet is, a really good time. There's all kinds of cool stuff in there. Some of it we touched on today. Some of it we didn't even get to like using super hot plasma lasers to like dig deep, super deep geothermal things through the earth and a uh, cool thread on nanotech. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed the hell out of this. So nuclear rockets, nuclear rockets. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I would love to have you back. Yeah. Um, and we could just run through which, whatever you've been tweeting about, whatever you're curious about. Um, Cause this is a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I Let's do, follow do up. a ton of this. Thanks for coming, Andrew. Appreciate you. Been a lot of fun. Thanks to you. Yep. See ya.